sleep. As humans, we know we need it, and we know that when we don't get enough, it can affect us all day long, if not longer. But what do we really know about it? What happens to our bodies and brains when we sleep, perchance to dream? Thankfully, there are scientists around the world studying all the things about it the rest of us don't even think about. Dr. Michael Grander of the University of Arizona, director of the Sleep and Health Research Program and director of the Behavioral Sleep Medicine Clinic, is one of those scientists. Sleep isn't just about rest. Sleep isn't, I'm out of energy. I'm going to plug in and recharge and like eventually my battery is going to be full and then I can be I can be active again. Sleep is actually a very active process. There's lots of things that are happening under the hood when you're asleep. He's here to teach us something about sleep. I'm Steve Fisher and this is Life Slices. Let's give our listeners some basis as to who they're listening to. Who is Dr. Michael Grandner? I am a clinical psychologist by training, uh, but my area of expertise and focus has always been in sleep and circadian rhythms. I've been working in this field for sort of as long as as long as I can remember, so probably about 20 years now. So my focus is on how we can translate what we know about sleep and circadian science into the real world. So what drew you to this field of study? Because it's awesome and fun and interesting. But no, more specifically... Did you have trouble sleeping as a kid? I don't think anything different from from anyone else. It was just that Actually, when I was in high school, I thought dreams were the coolest thing ever, and I wanted to learn all about them. And so every time I would find a book in the bookstore about it, I would read it. And and through that, I learned a bit about sleep science, but I didn't know it was a job you could have until I was in college. And I had a friend who got a job as an overnight tech in the sleep lab. And my response was, wait, we we have a sleep lab on campus. Why do I not know this? And then, like, that's so cool. And the person who was setting the lab up actually was going to be was new faculty and they're going to be teaching an undergraduate course the next year. And so I took it. I thought it was great. I volunteered to work in the lab and I learned what doing academic research in a medical center, what that was like as a career and and what that would look like in sleep. And the rest, I guess, is sort of everything that happened next. Were most of your patients at the sleep lab people who couldn't sleep in the dorms and had to check in for a night or two? No, no, no. So this was a research facility. So they it was usually funded by a government funded funded research. So for example, one of the first projects that I worked on was looking at brainwave patterns in people who have insomnia versus people who don't have insomnia. And for ex- for example, how the brain processes information going on in the environment while you're still asleep with the idea that people who have insomnia, even when they are asleep, it looks like their their brain has more wake-like activity than belongs there. And so this was a study, I mean, this was back when I was a college student, but we were looking at how the brains of people with insomnia are different and, and how and what that can teach us about how to fix insomnia more permanently. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah, it so was cool work. What is the behavioral sleep medicine clinic? And then what is the sleep and health research program? I kind of wear two hats here at the University of Arizona. So one is the Sleep and Health Research Program. That is where we write grants and papers, we do research projects, and write when they say study found, blah, 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 that would be uh, that would be me. So what we do is we ask for money and to do to answer a question, and then we do our best to answer that question in interesting and creative ways. So for example, one of the projects we have going on right now is being down here uh, in, in southern Arizona, we're right near the U.S.-Mexico border. And one of the things I've studied throughout my career is this issue of sleep health disparities, where sleep isn't just something something you do. It's something that's part of part of your the foundations of your biology. And when people aren't sleeping well, it can impact their health in many ways. Well it turns out in our society, you have certain people who are set up to sleep worse. So for example, someone working night shifts or multiple jobs or somebody who can't afford childcare or who has to wake up at four in the morning to take the right bus to get to work on time. There's certain people who don't have the same sort of control over things as as others and leads to less sleep. One of the things that we found was that people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged or people who are racial ethnic minorities are more likely to be getting insufficient sleep and and poor sleep quality and sleep disorders in the US and we want to we want to see if we can 
eliminate that and reduce that because if it sets people up for worse outcomes and if we can reduce that disparity we can we can improve people across the board so one of the projects we have going on right now is looking around the US Mexico border had issues related to acculturation and Americanization and, and militarization and stress and poverty and all these things that are going on. Uh, what is the role of sleep health at the interface of cardiovascular, metabolic, and immune health and social and environmental stress? Is it part of how we are embodying the world playing out in our health or is poor health feeding back through worse sleep to increase stress? And, and what is that complex relationship? And so that's one of the projects we're running. For example, another one that I, that I think is interesting but very different is we're looking at the neuroscience of why nothing good happens between two and five in the morning. More specifically, we discovered that suicides peak in the middle of the night during that time, three to four times more than you would expect by chance. And our hypothesis is that when you're awake, but your brain wants to be asleep, it's still not its still not functioning well, and your thinking and your feelings are dysregulated. So anyone who's been up at three o'clock in the morning has probably experienced that you're not your best self. You sometimes blow things out of proportion. You sometimes feel uh, emotional things differently than you do the next day and you look back on it. So we're doing a series of studies looking at the neuroscience of this. We're looking at suicide risk. We're looking at food choices, which also we think is the same process in the middle of the night where people don't make their best choices. No one craves a salad at two o'clock in the morning, for example. And so so we're doing a laboratory study where we're looking at, at how people think and feel and how they make choices around the clock. At di The same person at different times of day makes different kinds of choices uh, and trying to understand what's the neuroscience of that. So again, we can reduce that risk eventually. And people like people with insomnia or shift workers or other people who or college students or people who happen to be awake when their brain wants to be asleep, how do we protect them? So that's an example of the sort of projects we're doing. And then as the clinic, so that's sort of the other hat. So this is where patients come in, like you're going to the doctor, they make an appointment, they come in, they wait in the waiting room, then they come back, we do some evaluation and we fix their sleep problems, whatever they happen to be. We specialize in insomnia and complex sleep issues. Usually, if you come in and you say, oh, I've seen everybody, I've tried everything, nothing works, I say, well, you've come to the right place. We can maybe be a little creative about what we know about sleep and circadian science and, and apply it to your situation and try, and try and create some lasting change. So those are the two main hats I wear. How important it, it is, is it absolutely necessary for everyone to get eight hours of sleep a night? No, that's an easy question. I can answer that quickly. But with an, I, I, as, a, as a typical scientist, everything I say has an asterisk. We do need sleep. It is a biological requirement. It's not just something we do because we enjoy it. It's a, it's a foundation to how our body works. There's, it's, it's not a coincidence that every human has slept since the beginning pretty much every day. Eight hours is more of a round number where you're dividing the day into three. But if you look at the data, what does that even mean? What does eight hours mean? If you actually ask people, on average, how much sleep do you get in a typical 24-hour period? And then you correlate that with outcomes. What we find is seven and eight, people who say seven versus people who say eight, at least these days, it's indistinguishable statistically. There's almost never a situation where someone who says eight is doing better than someone who says seven, at least in our society. But that's different from if you tracked their sleep prospectively, where um, um, by prospectively, I mean moving forward. So like if every day I had you wake up and keep a log of when you went to bed and how much you were awake during the night, when you got up, and I did that calculation and I did that going forward, actually it would be, and then I asked you, how much sleep did you get? A typical person will actually, if they said seven, you know, if I did the math, it would probably end up being more like six and a half, maybe around seven. It'll be a, probably a little less than they, they sort of imagined. But then if I used a wearable to track you, that would be very different. That would probably pick up more like six to six and a half if you said seven, because it's picking up a lot of, you know, people wake up a lot more during the night than they remember. The device, if it's a good one, picks all those up but you don't remember them. So they would have never gone into your calculation. And all of our predictions are based on that self-report because that's what we have in large numbers of people. So when we say you need eight hours, what we really mean is seven. And by seven, we mean in answer to the question, on average, how much sleep do you get? If you're looking at your, your tracker and it's saying, oh, but it only says six, is that bad? Well, 
that's not the question that predicts the outcomes yet. We don't have the level of data yet to know exactly how much sleep on a tracker equates with seven retrospectively. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And I was going to ask because I have an Apple Watch, which tells me every day whether I hit my sleep goal or not, my sleep goal being eight hours. And even if I wake up knowingly in the middle of the night for a bathroom break or whatever, (laughs) typically at my age, it still says you've hit your sleep goal. So different devices are different. Some are more accurate than others. And, And by accuracy, you can have a device that's relatively inaccurate that people think is more accurate because you're measuring something different. Because remember, the the number a device comes up with, if it's measuring your biological sleep closely, is going to be very different from what you remember. It's going to be a little bit less. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. If your device doesn't show you waking up a bunch of times during the night, that's when I would worry because most people will have a bunch of awakenings that they don't remember. That's totally fine. Normal to wake up 10, 20 times a night and just have no memory of it. That's that's normal. That's fine. That's not medically harmful in any way. If you feel like your sleep is shallow or if you're remembering a lot of awakenings, that's another story. But if if you are using a tracking device and you want to see if it's accurate, and you look at the data it gives you, and it doesn't detect those awakenings, that's actually a sign that the device is actually not very good. The, the, the bad devices are ones that don't capture awakenings well. And that's, that's the, the, the test of a device isn't, did it detect whether you were asleep? It's more of a, did it detect when you weren't asleep? I like that because now, if I'm t- feeling tired during the day, I can blame Apple. <laughs> well, you can blame Apple anytime. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing where where these devices are just measurement tools. Like every measurement tool, there's assumptions and there's what do you do with that information? That's actually more interesting to me as a behavioral scientist. I care a lot about assessment and measurement, but it's really in service of what? What are you measuring and why? And are you measuring what you think you're measuring? So are you, people say like, well, I have insomnia because I'm only getting six hours of sleep. It's like, well, those are two different statements. Insomnia, you can have insomnia and get eight hours of sleep. Insomnia means you're trying to sleep and you can't. You could be sleep deprived and getting five or six hours of sleep and not have insomnia because you're purposely keeping yourself out of bed because you've got stuff that you're doing instead. That's not insomnia. And so people generally don't have a great understanding of sleep, except this general sense of I either like it or I don't. And sometimes they end up focusing on the wrong metrics. Well, it's interesting you say that because years ago I had I was having trouble sleeping and I went to a sleep specialist. And I I forget the term he used, but because I work at a regular nine to five job during the week, and then on weekends, I tended to stay up later and sleep in, that there was something off in my my rhythms. And he said to keep more of a, a solid schedule, even for every day of the week. That is the textbook correct answer, because the human body loves predictability. We are pattern recognition machines. And so the more predictable you can make your schedule, the more your body can predict predict what it's going to happen at certain times. And sleep isn't just about rest. Sleep isn't, I'm out of energy, I'm going to plug in and recharge. And like, eventually my battery is going to be full and then I can be, I can be active again. Sleep is actually a very active process. There's lots of things that are happening under the hood when you're asleep. And your body's trying to coordinate all of those things. So when is your immune system, your endothelial cells, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys, all your brain, all of these different organs, your skin, muscles, all of these different systems sleep. And during sleep, do different things than when they're awake. A lot of rebuilding, repairing, reorganizing, learning, integrating, preparing, all of this sort of stuff happens when you're asleep. And if your liver can predict pretty reliable, if the clocks in the cells in your liver have a really reliable estimate of when you're going to be asleep, and so do the ones in your skin, and so do the ones in your heart, and so do the ones in your kidneys, and they're all on the same page, they can work together really well and efficiently. But if sleep keeps becoming a moving target, then they become, then they're expending energy and they're slightly less efficient. And sleep doesn't have to be perfect. But the more of a moving target it is, the the less efficient sleep is at doing its job. And so your body doesn't know what a weekend is. We invented those. And so all it knows is that sleep becomes a moving target. That said, so the textbook answer is keep a regular schedule seven days a week because you're building predictability in the system. 
and your body loves it. Your immune system loves predictability, all of these sorts of things. However, if during the week, say you're sleep deprived because you're not having a healthy sleep schedule during the week, should you sleep in on weekends? Well, probably. So it's sort of like if I starve myself during the week and I have the opportunity to eat more on weekends to get proper nutrition, should I? It's like, well, probably eating healthy in two days a week is probably better than eating unhealthy seven days a week. And the degree to which it disrupts the the regularity of the system is probably outweighed by fixing a deficiency. So people on average who don't get enough sleep are more likely to get sick and gain weight and become diabetic and die sooner. But if they sleep in on weekends, if you're sleep deprived and sleep in on weekends, irregularity also predicts bad outcomes, but the degree that but the degree that the sleep deprivation is predicting the outcomes is obviously weakened at that point. So it's it's a complex system. But People should know this so that they can make informed choices. So is it smart? We hear very often, and I am retired retired from an office job, so I don't have to punch a clock. I go to sleep when I want. I wake up when I want, even though it's pretty much on a regular schedule. But is it a bad thing to not have a regular schedule? Should, should people who are not on the clock, as it were, with work, should they still be setting alarms? The degree to which you could make your schedule predictable is good. If your body's used to waking up at 5.30 to go to work and you no longer have to wake up at 5.30 to go to work, now your body, will, but your body actually wants to wake up at 8, wake up at 8. And wake, but wake up at 8 every day. Why not? And like, well, what if I want to sleep in? Actually, people don't actually understand that that even though there's a million causes of short-term insomnia, there's really one main cause of chronic insomnia, and that's chasing after lost sleep when you, when, when you lose it. It's sort of like if you have a day where you just kind of don't have an appetite, don't eat a whole pizza the next day just to make up for lost calories. You're fine. Actually get back to normal. And your body will make up the difference. And so what, what what ends up happening is when someone gets stressed and then they don't sleep or whatever, then the next night they'll spend all kinds of extra time in bed and either they'll sleep more or they won't. If they sleep more, now their day is starting at a different place and their duration of wakefulness is going to end at a different time. And so now it's going to throw their sleep the next night off, first of all. But even if they don't sleep, and often what happens is maybe your body's not ready yet. Maybe you're still processing whatever you're processing. Well, then what's going to happen is you're going to just start laying in bed awake and be frustrated. And now your level of frustration is going to add activation into your brain while you're trying to deactivate, which is going to make falling asleep even harder. And then it becomes this loop where the snowball effect, where the more the, tr- the harder you try to sleep, the more likely you are to not sleep, which then makes you more frustrated, which makes you try harder. And then that's where chronic insomnia comes. Chronic insomnia often happens when sleep becomes predictably frustrating and difficult. And that predictable stress becomes the very activation that keeps you awake when the original cause isn't even relevant anymore. How does the amount and quality of sleep affect other physical and mental conditions, or is it vice versa? Both. It goes both ways. It's sort of like, how does breathing clean air impact your body? Well, every cell uses oxygen and deals with toxins, but then again, with sleep, it goes both ways. So for example, if you're not able to get the amount of quality sleep. So it's not just amount, it's also quality. So sleep health is multidimensional. I mean, there's also timing and regularity, but it looks like the big, the, the biggest issues are, are maybe amount and quality. If you're not able to get the sleep that your body needs, it's not able to do those jobs so well. So on average, people who don't have good sleep health, it, it's not like a death sentence and like all of a sudden, oh no, I didn't sleep well. I'm going to get Alzheimer's next week. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's it's the same thing as like, I just ate a double cheeseburger. I don't now have diabetes. Like it doesn't work that way. It's similar. It's, I, I, you'll see me use a lot of food analogies. Very similar. It's more about a pattern over time. And so if you have a crappy diet for a year, okay, that might do some damage, but it's not that big of a deal. If you have a crappy diet for a decade, that's a different story. If you have a crappy diet for 50 years, that's an even different story. Same thing with sleep. If you have a few nights of bad sleep, who cares? If you have years of uh, of sleep difficulties, the likelihood that bad things happen increases. It doesn't mean they're definitely going to happen. It just means, let's say you're, you're, 
your chances of getting high blood pressure are 35 to 50 percent, which it is in the U.S. So if the risks go up by 20 percent, which is what they do, multiply that 35 times an additional 20, not 50, but tw- an additional 20 percent of 30, which is another five, six, seven percent. So now instead of like a 30 percent risk, you're now at a 37 percent risk. It doesn't mean you're going to become hypertensive. It just means, well, if you were going to, it's going to happen faster. Or if you were on the edge, it's another, it's a strike against you that's going to make it more likely. And, and this idea of relative risk is something that people sometimes have trouble wrapping their heads around, but that's what it's about. It's not about, is it going to happen or not? It's going to say, what's the probability, given your other aspects of life, that this is something that's going to happen? And you take that and you just dial it up a little more now, because now your body is fighting these other, is dealing with these other problems and is slightly less efficient. So what do we know? We know that people with poor sleep are more likely to gain weight. They're more likely to have trouble losing weight and gain weight faster. They're going to be more likely to develop obesity, stay obese. They're more likely to develop high blood pressure, diabetes. They're more likely to get sick, like the flus, ear infections, pneumonias, colds. They're more likely to stay sicker longer. Vaccines work less in people who aren't sleeping well. We know that you're, you're less able to fight infections. We know memory problems increase, focus and attention decreases, cognitive problems increase, substance use issues. People chase chase healthy sleep and, and activity with substance, whether you're over-caffeinating or alcohol is probably the most used sleep drug in the world. Insomnia is one is probably the most reliable predictor of new onset depression and anxiety disorders because it creates these changes in the brain and, and how you perceive the world. Suicide risk, insomnia, and poor sleep triple suicide risk, even even separate from depression. Wow. All of these outcomes, you miss more days of work, you make less money, you're less efficient and productive, you get promoted less, like real world sorts of things. You have more family problems, more interpersonal issues. Sleep is part of the foundation of how our brain and body works. So when you when you when you mess it up, you don't you can mess up all kinds of things. But it also means that when you're in poor health, it tends to worsen your sleep. And so it does go both ways. I mean, tell anybody who has a headache to, to sleep normally is like, well, if you have a migraine, it's hard to fall asleep. So so pain and sleep are, and, and, and illness and sleep go in this bi-directional relationship. Sometimes the sleep problem is the easier one to fix. So you brought up dreams earlier. I have found that I am having much more lucid dreaming since I retired than I ever did before. I mean, I, it's like almost every day I'm having a dream that I remember the next day and it's vivid and it's like almost like a full blown movie. Wow. So how does, how do dreams affect our sleep and how does sleep affect our dreams? Dreams are interesting where there, there's, there's two kinds of dreams. There's dreams that occur in REM sleep and non-REM sleep. And non-REM sleep is is the all the other sleep stages. Dreams in non-REM sleep are usually boring, rote, repeating, memorizing stuff. So like if you learned a new skill today, you'll probably have you might have some non-REM dreams of like doing the thing. Those aren't what people think of when they think of dreams. Most people will never remember those, but they do technically exist. When people talk about dreams, they're mostly talking about dreams that occur in REM sleep. In REM sleep, so as people know, it's named after rapid eye movements that occur during that sleep stage. The brain is, it's not deep sleep at all. It's very shallow. It's probably the shallowest sleep stage, except for stage one, which is which is more of a transitionary one anyway, but it's a very shallow sleep stage. You're, it's easy to wake up from REM relatively. Your brain is very active. What's interesting in REM sleep, that's when the the interesting dreams happen, the ones with characters and emotions and plots and things. The other interesting thing that happens in REM sleep is your your body actually is actively paralyzed because you want to be acting out your dreams, but you can't because there's another part of your brain that knows you're dreaming and tells all your muscles to stop because you will be giving it those instructions. So anyway, so you're actively paralyzed. You might twitch a little bit, but that's it. And your brain enters a state that it cannot enter any other way. It's it's sort of like the rules of reality no longer exist. And it's great because dreams do their job whether you remember them or not. Their, their evolution figured them out a long time ago as a way to learn about the universe and the world in ways that are between the lines. So like when we're awake during the day, a person's a person and a house is a house. And we can learn a lot that way. 
But sometimes if a person was also a house, there's things we can learn and draw connections to that enhance survival. And so evolution developed REM sleep and dreaming as a way to read between the lines of reality and learn things that we couldn't learn if we were only sticking to the script. So we, we have these things. We have them every day. We have them essentially every time we get into REM sleep, which is multiple times a night, usually about every 90 minutes or so. But the thing about REM episodes is they get longer and longer as the night goes on. And the longer the REM episode, the more involved the dream is. So a lot of people will say that whenever something happens in their life that allows them to sleep longer, they're more likely to remember more and have more vivid dreams. Because... All of that. So people who wake up after five, six, six and a half hours, most of what you're losing is REM sleep, is the dreams, is this learning and this, this, this emotional processing. So people who go from sleeping maybe a little bit less to sleeping a little bit more, they tend to experience more intense, more vivid dreams as, as this is all coming back and, and processing. And also, if your sleep's a little shallow, which happens as we get older anyway, it makes it that you're more likely to wake up during REM sleep because A, you're having more REM episodes and your awakenings become more likely because as we get older, we wake up more. And so you remember a dream if you only if you wake up from it. Otherwise, it, 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 go, it passes without your awareness. But if, you're, if you reach an age where A, you may be dreaming more because you're sleeping a little more because you have more, more time control and B, your sleep's a little more shallow. So you're more likely, A, you're more likely to be waking up during the REM sleep anyway, because you're having more of it. And also because your sleep's a little more shallow, it, you might be remembering more dreams and, and maybe more intense dreams. So if we dream of the love of our life and the next day we run into them in the store, should we immediately propose? No, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. So like, but there, there's a lot we don't understand Dreams seem to be the brain speaking to itself in its native language of a thought, emotion, metaphor, idea, connection. And people dream of things and then they happen. Is it that the dream is telling the future or is it that the dream is recognizing a pattern or an idea that you are then that that's on your mind and it draws your attention to it more? Maybe if you didn't have the dream before, you would have passed them and not noticed. But maybe your attention was piqued. Who knows? Interesting. Interesting. Michael, I've got about a, a, a hundred more questions to ask you, but we're out <laughs> of time. We we might have to do a return to this topic. Sure. But to to end this one, what are the best things for people to consider? consider to get the best night's sleep to get the best night's sleep you can number one give yourself enough time to be ready for sleep to wind down if you're going from going 100 miles an hour to trying to knock out unconscious right away it doesn't work that way like a car you don't go from 100 miles an hour in a car to to immediately stop you need to tap the brakes and slow down you don't go from 30,000 feet to parked at the gate. But a lot of people are like, but I get into bed and my mind just keeps racing. Well, that usually means that you trained it to do that because it was still going when you were in bed. You didn't give it enough time to be ready. And it's going to take the time whether you like it or not. So that's the number one thing is to allow yourself the time and space that you physically require. Otherwise, you're going to be forcing, you're trying to force an active mind and then get frustrated with forcing an active mind into bed. So that's number one. Number two is when you start the day, get out of bed, just keep going, get some light, get some movement. It's usually, people usually feel way better, especially with some bright light in the morning. You have more energy during the day. Lingering in bed doesn't help. Number three, if you're in bed and you cannot sleep, the best thing you can do is actually get out of bed. Sleep is not something you do. It is something that happens when the situation allows for it. And if something is out of your control, whether your body is active or your mind is active or something and sleep is not going to come, trying to force it is just going to make it worse. If you're not going to be asleep anyway, might as well get up. And so you're not tying that, that negative feeling into the bed. And then finally, sleep disorders are way more common than people think. Sleep apnea, insomnia. All these things. And if you've got a sleep disorder, all the sleep tips in the world aren't going to help you. You need to actually see someone who knows what they're doing to actually fix these things. They're highly treatable, but they're way more common than people think. Lots of people have sleep apnea and have no idea. Lots of people think they have insomnia that they can fix with over-the-counter sleep tips or, and, and supplements and stuff, but that's not what they're designed for. They're designed for subclinical issues, not for fixing disorders. You don't have to come to me. So if you have insomnia, if you're looking for someone who doesn't use medications, go to the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine, behavioralsleep.org. They have a direct 
directory online. If you're looking for a sleep physician, especially if you have sleep apnea or a medical sleep problem, go to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Their website for finding a, an accredited sleep center is sleepeducation.com. Find a sleep expert. We have years of training in this stuff. We know what we're doing. Usually my patients say, geez, I wish I found you 10 years ago. But don't don't count out sleep disorders. You, you're not on your own. And how well do you sleep? I sleep great now, now that I know what to do. Ask me in college, that would be very different. <laughs> there are many things in my life that are not optimal. I'm human, but I sleep great. And, and it doesn't get in the way of my functioning. Well, I usually end by asking somebody to answer a question that I haven't asked, but I'm going to hold off on that today <laughs> because I'd like to see if we can get a part two to this and get all the yeah, my other questions it. in. Let's do Thanks it. a lot, Michael. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Take care. My thanks to Dr. Michael Grandner for sharing his knowledge and for agreeing to a return appearance to tell us more about the wonderful world of sleeping. Look for that upcoming episode soon on Life Slices. In the meantime, get some sleep. If it doesn't come easy to you, seek professional help because your restfulness means so much more for your overall health. And don't think you can treat it yourself. Like so many other things in life, we can't do everything on our own. You wouldn't operate on yourself. You shouldn't try to represent yourself in court, and you definitely shouldn't try to launch yourself into outer space. Then again, if you did, chances are you'd never have to worry about getting enough sleep ever again. If you liked this program, please like Life Slices on social media and subscribe wherever you find fine podcasts. Life Slices is produced by Beatnik Ravens Productions, all rights reserved. Music courtesy of Fesley and Studios.